for coming to this uh, session this morning. I'm really excited to be here. This is my first Drupal camp, but I've given this talk at DrupalCon Portland in person last year, and I gave a virtual version of it at DrupalCon Prague last year as well. So I've never been to any Drupal camp. Uh, I've also been to GovCon before, in part because I live in Washington, D.C., but I am very excited to be back in Asheville, and I'm excited to be sharing some lessons that I learned from a Drupal migration that we did that involved auditing PDFs for 508 at scale, which sounds like a pretty dry topic, and I'm always surprised, at, pleasantly surprised at how many people show up to it, because I think it's a universal problem if you work with the government in particular. Uh, and on that note, my name's Lauren Maffeo. I am a service designer for an organization called Steampunk. We are a human-centered design firm that builds technical solutions for federal government agencies including Drupal websites. I wrote a book on designing data governance programs called Designing Data Governance from the Ground Up, uh, which is available from the Pragmatic Programmers. You can also get it at Amazon and Barnes & Noble, anywhere else you get books. It's available now. I was a correspondent for opensource.com for two and a half years, so I was in the community correspondence program um, in part under Amy June for a while. And I've been in tech for over 10 years and contributing to various open source communities for five and probably have made the most contributions to Drupal overall, which is another reason I'm excited to be here today. And so I mentioned earlier that I'm here to share some advice I gained from a Drupal project that I was on at work. Uh, the project is still ongoing, so I'll keep my client's identity private, but we learned a lot during this discovery phase about auditing content at scale in order to prep for a Drupal migration. And specifically, we learned how crucial it is to design Drupal sites and their content for 508 compliance from the start. So I will give an overview of what 508 compliance is and what we did to tackle this thorny problem. Uh, this, to start off, we had to do this project in four key phases across the initial six-month discovery period. We started out by auditing the content and inf information architecture for the .gov website as it existed in PHP. We then had to prepare all of the content for migration to Drupal 9. This was going to be the agency's first ever CMS, so they had literally decades of content and data on their website website that was not managed in any type of structure in the PHP site. We did have to ensure that all of the new content would meet 508 requirements once it was in Drupal, and we had to account for all the content on the site in both HTML and PDF format. And I mentioned 508 compliance on my last slide, and if you're not familiar with it, you might be wondering what it is. The US government is required by law to make all of its content accessible to everyone because the idea is that someone who is deaf should not be prohibited from listening to a meeting recording just because they can't hear. And likewise, someone who is blind should be able to get the information they need from a website no matter which format that information is in. And, sorry, I'm trying to... And so according to the World Bank, 1 billion people globally have at least one disability, and that amounts to 15% of the total population. So when we talk about 508 compliance, it's really a way to make sure that everyone can access the internet. The disability spectrum is really broad, but for this presentation, we'll talk about it in the context of screen readers and making sites accessible to those who are deaf, have hearing loss, and or blind, because those are the groups that typically use assistive technology in order to access websites, and so when you make your content accessible, it's typically done in that context of making it accessible for things like screen readers and other assistive tech. So once my team dug into the site's content in PHP, we quickly saw what a challenge this was going to be because our client's website, uh, website had 5K PHP web pages, 52,000 PDFs, and no hierarchies. So there was really no information architecture. There was no, there were no like parent-child relationships established. And their primary way to share information was through PDFs, and it had been that way for decades. 
that is a big barrier to 508 compliance, which I'll explain in this uh, presentation later. And the bottom line was that they had tons of valuable, insightful content and data that was nested into these PDFs, and there really wasn't a coherent way for users to find it, uh, let alone to search for it, because as you can imagine, the search function on the PHP site was not great. So even whether people had a disability or not, finding what they needed on this website was very challenging, and we quickly realized it was not going to be enough to just move it over. We had to create new structures. And when we talk about 508 compliance, it's very different for HTML versus PDFs. With HTML, that's the expected 508 compliant format for screen readers, so it's pretty straightforward. It's a quicker format to update than others. It's also more easy to make responsive, and it's better for multimedia than embedding that multimedia into PowerPoints or PDFs. Uh, PDFs are very hard to update, um, and so that means that if they're not designed for compliance from the start, making them compliant retroactively is very hard. And so that's for many reasons. It's, they're difficult to update, they are not easy to make responsive on phones and tablets, and because they are not the expected format for screen readers, screen readers have a very difficult time accessing them if they can do it at all. And I mentioned earlier that this project is still in progress. I'm not on it anymore because service designers are typically brought in in the discovery phase of a project. We're typically on for one, you know, six months, maybe up to a year or two. So I'm no longer on the project, but the, the Drupal build is still going on. And we did complete these key actions in phase one to help us with preparing the content for Drupal and for compliance. We started by uh, conducting user interviews and, use and ultimately usability testing on wireframes and mockups, but, bef but at we, and then we did those user interviews uh, in tandem with collecting data on the site from Site Improve and Google Analytics, which our client used to measure their web traffic and data about it. We also created an as-is information architecture map in Mural, which is a design tool to show our client how things were structured today. And we also started hosting a series of card sorting and stakeholder mapping workshops with the client to get them to start thinking about content as something with a structure, something to be organized, and something that should have a hierarchy. As one example, they posted a lot of state-specific data and content, and so an easy way to approach that is to organize it all according to states uh, from a drop-down menu. And so these are the initial approaches that we took. But as part of that, we also prioritized participatory design, and this is part of the human-centered design process, which we really emphasize at Steampunk because we want to make sure that we really know the people that we are building technology for, and we want to include as wide a range of users in our initial user research as we possibly can. So participatory design is a type of design that involves all stakeholders, including users in the design process, so it engages your users and stakeholders alike, whether or not they have a vested financial interest in the product. It prioritizes processes and procedures over styles, and ultimately the goal of it is to give everyone a, sh a vested interest in a product's success so that they will be more likely to use it and have a satisfactory user experience. Now keep in mind that we hosted participatory design over COVID, uh, so the information that we collected, the interviews we conducted, they were all over Microsoft Teams, and we did this with many different users, including several who did have uh, disabilities and were deaf so one person was deaf and blind, a separate person was hard of hearing, so they had had hearing loss throughout their adulthood. Um, we also ex uh, selected interviewees who had experience auditing for accessibility, so the user we spoke with who is hard of hearing had almost two decades of experience auditing uh, university websites for 508 compliance in the state of North Carolina. So she was not only somebody who had lived experience of, be, of having a disability, she also had experience with audits and knew how to assess websites for accessibility. 
And so we conducted user interviews and usability testing sessions with these users. And uh, usability testing comes after you've done the initial user interviews. Basically, you take the user interviews you've done, you create design assets like user personas and journey maps, which are informed by the conversations you had with them in the, your user interviews. That those conversations and those design assets help you prioritize what to design first before you invest technical resources into it. And so then once you do have your wireframes and mockups ready, you can conduct usability testing where you guide the users towards specific actions on a page and you have to stop yourself from trying to hear that or trying to guide them through it. But the results of our participatory design were that we took their input and directly embedded it into our own project and really tried to put that advice they were giving at the forefront of our work. So the results of our participatory design were that we presented the recommendations they gave for accessibility improvement at sprint demos, our sprint demos to the client we would present every two weeks and we would uh, share not only what we had accomplished but also recommended next steps and so we always ensured that the, we were including information about the site because they wanted that user audit, they wanted that user feedback so we used that as an opportunity to to show how we could make their site compliant in the migration. We also prioritized their feedback in our mockups and wireframes. We used Adobe XD and Jira as a mixture of Adobe XD for the designs, and then we would prioritize uh, tickets and activities to do in Jira so that they were getting into every sprint and we were integrating that feedback directly into the work. We also committed to 508 QA and testing pre-production. So the website is due, I believe, to be launched in 2024 or 2025. So there will be a thorough round of testing on the site before it goes live. And again, it is being designed and built with 508 in mind, which is a, a long way away from what it was like in the past. And ultimately, the client did say that they wanted to commit to changing the content delivery experience moving forward. Uh, they were aware that PDFs were not the way. They had been choosing, they had chosen PDFs at, and chooses an interesting word they really had been roped into it in a lot of ways because they were there was a legal requirement at one point that they deliver the content that way and as with many things in the government there was a rationale for it that is long outdated uh, and that leads us to the next section in this presentation uh, you might still be wondering this is all great it's nice that you are designing for 508 up front but what about those 52,000 pdfs how did you solve that problem the, this is, an, again, an ongoing project, and there are many ways that you could tackle this issue. Uh, and there, the, there are several options here that we, ha, that we are considering, that we did consider and went over with the client. The, uh, the main challenge here is not just the accessibility of the content, but also thinking about how to structure it and label it on the new site. There are a few options to do that. You can make a PDF repository. Part of the challenge before with the client site was that you, the PDFs were all over the place. It was There was no icon denoting what was a PDF that was going to take you to a new web browser versus what was an HTML page. So there's that's another option. You can denote PDFs by adding icons for any non-HTML content. You can also provide optional word and text options per PDF. I mean, creating those 52K times over would be pretty in time intensive, but you can provide alter alternate uh, options per PDF. And then there's the other option, which is you can borrow a developer who has experience in PDF parsing from another project to help you do this. And we did uh, invest in that for about at least two to three weeks. We did we hired some, or not hired, we brought over one of our developers who specializes in, in PDF parsing to help us with that project uh, and so if and this the bigger goal here the bigger takeaway here is look at what resources you have in-house and look at the big uh, what the big 
challenge is because the first aspect of that is getting the content out of the PDFs and to do that you might have to hire some specialized skill uh, people with specialized skills uh, and then once it's out then you still have to figure out how to organize it and structure it and then that gets into um, information architecture which is a totally different conversation um, but then let's say you don't have that specialized help you don't have an engineer on your team with that skill set you do still have these options uh, because I think many of you are here not just to learn about how to make new sites compliant you're also probably like me and you've been in cases where you've worked with Drupal sites that had a huge repository of non-compliant content and you're thinking what do I do with this these are a few options and so some parting words of wisdom here are to design for 508 from the start whenever you can uh, and to consider the best format for your content. So sometimes PDFs are the best way to present the information at hand, but you really want to be thinking about whether your content on your site is best on the page, whether it's best in a, in a PDF. Uh, you want to consider that from the start. And you really want to prioritize responsive design that has easy editing access along with prioritizing participatory design. The earlier you start doing this, the earlier you start speaking with the Drupal sites users, the better data that you will get qualitatively to complement any quantitative data and metrics you might have about the site. And having both of those in hand as you design the site moving forward is really valuable. You, of course, do want to invest in testing for 508 in production before your pages go live and uh, because data and content on sites can get stale or fall out of compliance over time you do want to have somebody doing regular audits and QA to ensure that you stay in compliance and it will come probably as no surprise to all of you that uh, retroactively making PDFs 508 compliant is hard and doing it at scale is almost impossible doing it we we when we were trying to figure out just the scope of the problem and the scale of the problem, we did have a conversation about what would it take to go into all of these and make them compliant. Doing that manually is, it's not possible. I mean, it would involve such an enormous investment in time and money and resources. And so that's why we started looking at other solutions and looking at other other options because it, it, it making this is an example of technical debt on a Drupal website that is very hard to overcome. And it's, I would say it's harder in a way than planning for the future. Now that said, uh, there are principles for accessible PDF design, and so sometimes a PDF is the path forward, sometimes your client needs or demands the PDFs, and you do have options to make them accessible from the start. These tips that I'll end with come from Indiana University, and they discuss ways to make PDFs accessible to screen readers using Adobe Acrobat Pro. So the first is that if you want to convert a text that is an image to selectable text, you can go to Tools, Text Recognition, and In This File. If you want to add alt text to images, you can follow this path here. Uh, and alt text is very important because it describes to screen readers what is happening in the photo, in the image, and so, and so you want to uh, add those whenever you are adding an image to a Drupal site because you can have it in there and then it is part of the website itself that screen readers can utilize. If you want to set the screen or reading order, uh, the reading order tells screen readers which order they should read content in for users on a page. And if you want to set that, you can go to Tools, Accessibility, Touch Up Reading Order. And finally, if you want to set the language, you can go to File, Properties, Advanced, and Reading Options. So it, again, going away from PDFs altogether is probably not an option for many of you, uh, but if you do have an opportunity to make PDFs in Drupal accessible, these are some tips you can follow. And then the principles outlined where you do a mix of participatory design, with, ideally with users who have disabilities, and you collect data on the site which tell you what to prioritize and which pages to to redesign first. Uh, you can make a lot of progress and you can help everybody ex access government websites like it is their right to do. 
So that was a bit of a, of a quick one. Uh, I, we still have a good amount of time, um, so I'm happy to take questions and, uh, and chat more about this until it's time for the next session. Yeah. You know how many automated ways to... To parse the PDFs? Well, to uh, you know, do accessibility remediation. I've got a work for a little call here, let me tell you. And uh, we migrated their site from seven to eight. And we brought over everything not normally we needed or not, you know. And uh, four years later, here we are, and I'm just now getting around to doing everything. But I mean, I've been doing accessibility remediation on PDFs all along, but it's just, you know, another smile of task. We've got catalogs, almost 400 pages. Right. And I've been there eight years, and I have yet to be able to get it accessible because I'll be starting on it. You pull it off mm -hmm. something else, you know what I mean? And because it's never it enough of a priority to put all yeah. of, right, because it's, uh, yeah. We just, within the last couple of months, been doing you know, a side audit to go through and figure out what we need to keep, whether we need it or not, whether we need to keep it, you know, get rid of it, whether it was you, whether we can, like PDS, whether we convert them, could convert them to, you know, web pages or web forms, or whether they need to stay in the young PDF form to be able to print out or, you know, whatever. Um, and I pulled it down, we have like 4,000 PDFs, and I pulled it down to 1,000 so far, but I mean, still we keep getting here you know, right. every, I need some way to do it. But, um, <laughs> right. So you might be wondering uh, why didn't I suggest that my client do a content audit? Uh, because I know that you mentioned it in there, uh, doing a content audit of the site, and so you might you might be thinking, well, they don't need all those fifty-two thousand PDFs, so why don't they do an audit? According to them, they do. Uh, we asked about doing a content audit, and I said, uh, and we said, you know, why don't we audit your site for you for you, and and we can decide whittle it down to what is absolutely essential to go over to Drupal. And they quickly shut us down by saying we already did that and everything on the site is what needs to be moved over. So those 52,000 PDFs were important enough that they did need to get migrated over. And uh, trust me when I say I, I probably spent the equivalent, uh, the hours equivalent of a day looking for, I was like, there has to, I was like, how is there no automated way to do this? How is there no with all the tools available, with all the, the AI that exists today, how is this still so manual? And there are some tools, I mean, so you can, you might, one thing to look into is you might wanna look into robotic process automation tools to see if they can do it. Um, but there, but it really, at the end of the day, like you need someone who knows how to parse PDFs um, and can do it pretty quickly because that's a highly specialized skill set, but it's highly valuable. And so and it, it can honestly reach the point of maybe just hiring a contractor for a couple of weeks or a month, however long it takes. Like I said, at Steampunk, we did find a, a engineer and he was thankfully in between client projects and so we got him for about two to three weeks to really help us get it out um, because that was the problem until we got the content out we couldn't begin to even start organizing it to, stru to start structuring it i mentioned earlier that we did some card sorting exercises with our stakeholders to try to get them to think about content on a website in terms of hierarchies, but we but we needed it out first. And I was really stunned at how expense either expensive it is to do it in an automated way, and that's if you can do it in an automated way at all. So there is so my unfortunate I wish I had better news. It is still it's still pretty grim in terms of solutions for this. Um, but I do think your best bet to do it as fast as you can is to get somebody who who has that expertise in PDF parsing. That would be, that would be <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So it's just uh, yeah, along with everything else, right? That's the th and that's the thing we talked about too is that just getting the content out. I mean, it, doing that manually, it was going to take just an absurd amount of time. And when you're trying to not only do a migration, but then build a new website, I mean, and we had a team, I mean, as you do on these projects, we were a team of six, I mean, so it, we had like two developers. So it was, uh, it, there was just a lot to do. And at the end of the day, and it's like, it has to be done. And yet it's not 
a priority if it makes sense they they try to have it both ways but it's 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 a tricky it's a tricky one for sure um and like i said i was i was surprised by the scale of the problem because i thought surely there's got to be some se some sequel command or something but no yeah so with all this knowledge and technologies you are suggesting them to use going forward, mm -hmm. how to remediate these PDFs because they are going to keep them, how you are suggesting them to enforce it? How I know the site is not live yet, but what are ways to to force this community <laughs> to, to make sure so they much. to make sure they stay compliant, you mean? Yes. So I think, uh, so we, I mean, they do have an in-house accessibility specialist who I believe that her job is to do continuous testing uh, to make sure that everything about the site stays in compliance. Um, but it's in terms of filing a, you know, keeping them compliant, it's, I, I'll be honest, I do not know much about the process of of an appeal or trying to, I, to trying to get, uh, I think they are legally required to give an accessible version of whatever content exists. And so, if someone, let's say, who is blind, reaches out to this agency because they can't access the information in a PDF, that the agency is legally required to give them an accessible part um, or an accessible way of viewing the information. Now, their argument could be that it happens infrequently enough that when it does, they can give them a. a a, a bespoke word or txt uh, version of it um, and that is 